All right, I'm so excited to have Walter Mac Davis with me to talk about Kafka. I can't imagine anything I'd rather do, I have to say. Uh, so I've known Mac for uh, 30 years maybe now. <laughs> and uh, and I, I want to say that I don't know anyone who knows more about Kafka and who has a better better insights into Kafka than him. So that's where we'll start. And then we'll start. Yeah, I've with really the, been set up here. I know. <laughs> where can you All go? All I can with? say about the 30 years is I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's paradoxical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So let's start with the borough, because this is the story that we both looked at recently. And then we'll kind of expand from that onto other things. So I guess my question, the borough is, what do you think, what do you think Kafka is getting at with the relationship to home in, in that story? And maybe, I mean, if, if you want to start with something else, you can, but that that's just where I was, where my thinking was. Well, is the home thing for you connected with the search for security? Yeah. For yeah. safety, for silence. Yeah, for safety, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've always been in it. It's it's my take on far too many things. I've always seen the bur, bur whatever the hell the name of it is, the burrow, as one of the great studies of the self defeat of the obsessional mind. Uh, again and again, I've almost finished my burrow and it seems very good. And then he finds the seeds of doubt within his certainty. And then he goes through a process of, of exorcising those doubts and achieving a new certainty that collapses. And it's, it's uh, the obsessional. I think I have a quick take on the obsessional. The obsessional is always destroying his own arguments because he's trying to convince himself of something that he knows is false. Right. Uh, an right. example would be once uh, Leontes decides that his wife is guilty of adultery or once Othello does, they can try to persuade themselves forever that it's not true, but they will always persuade themselves again that it is true because right. that's what they're trying to talk themselves out of. I think the guy in the borough is trying to talk him into the possibility that there's some certainty that he can achieve right. uh, that will involve uh, uh, a safety. Uh, but I'm struck how at the end of the story, even the thing he's afraid of seems to be a fantasy. Right. And, and, and appealing almost, doesn't it? Like, I mean, that's what strikes me about the story is, and I think I agree totally with what you're saying, but I was just struck by how, he he's so invested in the threat, right? Like he he yeah. really wants there to be a threat. But I think you're right that in the end, the threat is phantasmatic, right? Like yeah. that's the, yeah, yeah. that's what I, I was also, I, I wondered like when he goes outside the bureau and then, and then in order to sort of, and then yeah. he's, he's, he's very, he's afraid to ever make the move back in because he thinks someone will be trailing him. And I thought, well, that's how Kafka is going to end the story. When I first read it, I thought it's going to be like the castle. You can never, you know, you can never yeah. enter, but then he does get in and it's the, but the problem doesn't change. So I thought that was a fascinating thing that, that he shows in this story, unlike in the castle, when you get in, it doesn't really change anything because the obsessional mind goes with you both That's places. Right. Yeah. And, and that suggests to me that the story is really about the inner mind. Yeah. Producing all of the various things that uh, uh, that frustrate it, because uh, I think, and I was thinking of you when I was thinking of this this morning. It, it, you can say that this guy is, uh, in terms of your th notion of desire, is that he wants to frustrate himself, right, right, so that he can keep doing this thing. Although it's interesting, at the end, he seems to to say the heck with it. That 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 I know now I can't achieve any certainty, and I feel good about that. I know it's almost like I mean I almost think this is one of the more optimistic stories from Kafka, isn't it? it I, I guess it depends on how you read the ending. Uh, there's a there's <laughs> there's a Kafka esque hook on that. I believe it was the last story he wrote. Oh, I didn't know that. And I believe it was unfinished. 
that uh, uh-huh. don't mind it was unfinished. So, but that would fit right in with it. That it that it it's a story that can't end. I think uh, because the minute that guy achieved, I'll, I'll see if I can get my my text here exactly what he says. Uh, at the very end, he says, "But all remained unchanged." Right. Right. Which to me suggests that he's immediately going to have to start a new process. Yeah, but yeah, it, I wonder if that. I, I think all, that it all remained unchanged. Mean to you that he's he he hasn't achieved what he's been going for. Right. I think that's right. And I but I wonder if recognizing that all remained unchanged isn't the point at which he is changing. You know, that's what I mean. You know. It depends, I guess, on how much you credit the recognition, if that can be the, the vehicle for any kind of, well, you know, psychic I, I, change. I, I want to throw in Fichte here. If yeah, I can. yeah. And the notion that the mind's experience of itself is the very thing that changes the mind. It's yeah. The very force whereby the mind becomes uh, itself. Uh, the thing that I find interesting in Kafka is that that process which I've always thought of as some kind of self-overcoming, seems to be a production of more and more and greater frustration for the mind. It says right. if the mind, the mind's uh, relationship to itself is self-torment, that that's its deepest relation for Kafka. For Kafka, not for you, interestingly. Not for me. No, yeah. no, it's not for me. Yeah, well, that is interesting. That you're, you're, here, so they don't, you, people don't get things wrong. Mac Davis is no optimist, folks. No, but but I think actually on this on this question, you compared to Kafka, you do see some kind of possibility for emancipation through yeah. this inner struggle. Whereas I think Kafka's famous line that we often quote back to each other: "There's an infinite amount of hope, but not for us." Right? Like that. I think yeah. he really means. I mean, that's clear. I think in almost every story. Yeah. I, I, I believe so. I think Kafka is, uh, it's one of the things that makes him great is his single-minded pursuit of that torment and mm-hmm. of his taking away every chance that it could be ameliorated in some way. That becomes his immediate target. Uh, it reminds me of Hamlet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, yeah. A great deal. Uh, and of course, the question, and I want to say that that is the first true movement of self-reflection, to take issue with yourself, to find yourself in internal torment, to see that the mind uh, overturns itself, etc. Uh, I have I have felt that that's the first step in a process that that goes somewhere else, but. But Kafka can't make the next step, right? Like he, I mean, I think you would say he's a kind of in an arrested, what would you say? Like an arrested dialectic, right? Like he can't. Yeah, he, but 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 I'm nervous because that's putting myself in a position of greater strength than a writer who I can't, I, I, I'm reminded of the thing that, uh, you probably know that story that Thomas Mann gave a copy of Kafka short stories to Einstein. And he said, I didn't, I don't know this. No, what, it's a great what, story. He gave it to his, his friend, Einstein. Uh, <laughs> and he said, read some of these. And a couple of days later, Einstein brought the book back to Mann and gave it to him. And he said, the mind is not complex enough to understand this. Wow. Isn't that a remarkable thing? That is a great <laughs> statement. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's one of the permanent fascinations of Kafka, that we feel that that mind is something that we, it's like the castle. We can't get there. Yeah, yeah. So th- that's interesting. So there's something, you think the fascination that Kafka has over us is in part because this there's something inapproachable about his his psyche even to us. I agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's not... What is that one that they talked about, an enigma wrapped within a puzzle or some damn thing? Right, right. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck at the moment because for some reason my mind is reaching back 
to a way out of the Kafka. I, I think Kafka is like this story. You get in him and you can't get out. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, to me, the great contrast is Joyce, right? Like the like Kafka's work isn't difficult. It's not, I mean, that's the thing that's so striking is that it's not, like, that's why I think what you said about the enigma wrapped within a riddle, like, it's not that. It's like, there's there's something really approachable, unlike Joyce, and, and yet, Good and yet, there's then this, there's like you, it's like this unknown that you can know, right? Like that's the, I think that's the difference with, with yeah. Joyce. It's ages since I've read any Kafka in German, but I remember it as being extremely clear. Yeah. Simple. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm reading and I'm saying something like, well, this is like Hemingway. This isn't like Faulkner or Thomas right. Mann. Uh, it's very clear. And that's part of its beauty is that this is a lucid, logic every step is a logical step that leads to the worst possible conclusions and what i love about it is that he is constantly finding that i say i'm thinking now of the 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 thing that frigga said about how every assertion contains an assumption and that's what's really being asserted to which i always add yes and it's also wrong Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's an incorrect yeah. assumption. But I think that's what Kafka does again and again, is he leads you and he's always asked that he always takes that next step that shows the previous one had something wrong in it that invalidates it. That makes it, uh, but I don't think it's it just invalidates it. It's more like uh, an interrogation process where you think they're going to stop torturing you if you say this. And it turns out that, no, it only leads you into a deeper kind of torture. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's real. I mean, so, I mean, it, couldn't you read the chapters of the trial exactly according to the logic you just laid out? Like okay. one, like you get to a certain point and then what's asserted by K then gets undermined by what comes next, I think. Yeah. It's it's really, and, you know, I, I mean, to me, that's the great work because it's the one that really captures the psychic, you know, the, the psychic dimension of what he's trying to do. That's the one that's always appealed most to me. Uh, I mean, I know there are many people who think the castle is a greater work, and it may it may well be, but the torment level of the trial, uh, I guess this is my own Kafka's Judaism, my Roman Catholicism speaking, the sense that guilt, and it's almost original sin, for God's sake, yeah. it's guilt is a priori. You are guilty. Uh, you you are you are you you can't defend, and every attempt you make to to do something with that guilt only leads you further into into knowing that there's nothing you can appeal to. Because he keeps saying, it, K Joseph K keeps saying, and I can appeal to something. Right, right. And like right. The, the law doesn't it summons you when it does, and it lets you go when it lets you go. And, you know. Right. I mean, that's a the, the, like you like, reading. The, well, I think, don't you think that even the fact that he, it's a, it's a lo- legal case suggests appeal, right? And, and yeah. then, and there's nothing, and even in the legal system, there's no court of appeal. I think that's a great point. I mean, I, I, I feel like that's in some way the essence of what Kafka, like there's no net beneath him yeah. to, and, and I wonder, you know, I, I was going to, I, this is one of the things I really was curious about. Do you think to what extent, so you mentioned, of course, that Kafka, his Jewishness plays a part in that, but I wonder to what extent you think he really is a Jewish writer and that, that to know that is really important. That's, that's such a complicated question. Uh, uh, and I'll take a, I'll take a back stab at it, reminding you of that. I directed Paul's dissertation on the Holocaust literature and one of the, I'm a German, by the way, folks, one of the uh, Jewish members of the faculty was troubled and said to Paul, uh, uh, you, I think you should have a Jew direct your dissertation on the Holocaust. And Paul said, I did better. I got a German. That's, he did say that. That's, this is our friend Paul Eisenstein, who you're, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there is, I think there's a really strong connection of Kafka to the Torah and that interpretation is endless. And that interpretation is always discovering something in the law that no one had understood before. So there is that thing. But I want to resist the easy move to Derrida with all of that. Right. Because uh, I think for Kafka, it's a real 
genuine anxiety or even anguish of of the notion that you have to continue interpreting that there's no way to stop this thing uh also uh and we're learning this more and more law is a strange thing it's texts that are always being reinterpreted right i wonder I mean, this. So I like this idea that the imperative to interpret is generative of anxiety. That that's the that uh-huh. it's not. There's not some kind of, you know, you, a play of interpretations. Instead, there's a there's an, a, a drive that creates anxiety. And I think I think Kafka's the great writer of anxiety, maybe for that reason. I wonder though about this about this question about law. Is and I, I'm I'm this is a genuine question. I have no, I, I I go back and forth on this. I wonder, is it is Kafka responding to law as such, or is he responding to some kind of modern, I don't know, like, uh, I just for lack of a better word, like a super egoization of law, like the way in which law has been distorted into super ego, or is he just responding to law as such, do you think? I, I, I want to throw that back at you and say it's clearly super egoic. Okay. But I wonder if, if it's true, both things you said. Mm -hmm. It's a superego reaction to the law and that the law is also inherently a superego structure. Right, Right. that there's no such, in other words, so you would want to claim that there's no such thing as a dead law. Like Like I think Kafka is the great writer about the law as alive and sexual, right? Like that's the thing in Castle, which is why I think Castle, look, I'm with you. I think trial is the, my favorite, but I think if I had to say like, what's the more theoretically Fecund, I would say castle. And I think for this reason, because I think it really gets at this sexualization of the authority. And I, I guess I guess what what you're saying is there's no such thing as just a dead law that remains dead for us to, you know, respond to it. Uh, let me let me try to throw a different angle on the idea of the law. OK. Uh, I can remember two encounters with policemen, of my many encounters with policemen. And uh, one guy, uh, I was complaining about something, and he just, to put an end to discussion while he was arresting me, he said, it's the law. Mm -hmm. That is, to assert that something is the law is to close all interpretations, to put an end to all of them. Another time I'm in jail. And uh, the cops are are giving us a rough time in jail, and and they're coming around, and and uh, uh, they they said, well, you guys are going to be out of here in a few minutes." And I said, "That's bullshit." So the cop got me out of the cell, and he took his poker and poked me in the testicles, and and I said, "You're violating my rights." And he said, "You have no rights in here." Mm. triumphantly yeah those were two very powerful examples to me of one attitude toward power and the law that it's the thing that puts an end to Mm. uh uh conversation to to uh uh but I, I, but I want to. I want to think of that almost as the most brutal super ego assertion. Yeah. That you know it's power, and I'm going to put. And this guy said, "You open your mouth again, we in his jail. You're going to lose your balls." Yeah. Right, right. I did open my mouth again, but but I, I gave it forethought. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, your all your students have read this story, the judgment? Yeah. That to me, and and I think that was one of the first stories where Kafka said, wow, I, I, I'm a writer. I think that's right. He wrote Through the Night, I think, when he wrote yeah. that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're right. This was the great breakthrough. Yeah. And what's amazing is you, look, you saw your father's dirty underwear, go kill yourself, and he does. Yeah. If I remember it correctly. That's correct, yeah. That, it's that. And, of course, the scene, the father's underwear, is a very dreamlike scene. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, and you have that thing in Kafka again and again, which I love, that you don't know whether you're in dream or not. 
Right. But you don't know whether the logic is a dream logic because everything for him seems to finally be part of a dream logic. Right. Um, that to me was the greatest example of a superego that I've ever run into. Yeah, I, I want to. So about that story, I, I agree with you totally. But I wonder about that story because. What struck, I've read it many, many times. What struck me, what always strikes me about that. Now, the end is, is, is I think you're clearly right. Like it is this super egoic moment. But there, and I think this is what's fascinating about trial as well. Like that, that, that Georg, I think is the, the main character's name. Like he's, he is guilty of something. Like he is, he is treating this friend terribly and justifying it to himself. And so, what the father picks up on is something that really exists. And so that's what I think is interesting, that it's not just this, you know, creation of guilt. It's, I'm I'm actually picking up on this, you know, really kind of horrible thing that Georg had done relative to his friend. And and I wonder, I just wonder about that. And I think it's true in the trial as well, like that K, I mean, this is, I think, the whole point of the parable before the law, that K is he's, he's done these things. Like he's, he's made himself available to the law and it's, and it's oppression or, or repression in a certain way. I wonder what you think about that. A lot of things. I, I think Heidegger said this in being in time where he argues about a guilt before deeds, right? A guilt that's there by the very fact of existence that is part of, uh, uh, uh being there that, that you've always chosen uh, 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 that you've always not given enough, that you've always chosen and excluded other things, that there's always uh, some uh, uh, fault or uh, uh, lack that you are trying to fill by saying, I did this. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a, in a culture where we were taught from a very early age to examine our conscience and to examine it in order to find things that we would have to confess. And if we didn't find things we had to confess, we were guilty of not doing a proper examination of our conscience. Mm -hmm. We were lax uh, and, and that laxity and scrupula were, were the two ways mm -hmm. that, and that, that, I think that was my first experience of a Kafka-esque situation where the thing that seems to attach you to some uh, very definite set of procedures that can establish something is really attaching you to something much more deep and insidious. Mm -hmm. There's so many times people try to take Kafka and find some uh, a key to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, enable him, you know, it's his Jewishness, it's 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 his uh, 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 being in uh, uh, in in Prague. It's it's uh, something that we can re trace back to some psychoanalytic, a very simple psychoanalytic thing a conflict with the father i don't think any of those things work in the in the slightest yeah i think they are uh attempts to avoid what what i i guess i want to come back to and say that the richness of reading him is in proportion to the degree of torment you're willing to take pleasure in mm -hmm. now i don't know about that last take pleasure in i i added that part for you uh <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like that part yeah, because I, I think that I, I think, that, yeah, I think there's I think it's incredibly pleasure. I mean, like, that's the funny thing, right? Like, I think I think you're absolutely right that, that there is it's a torment. But I, I also would say I find reading Kafka as pleasurable as like, unlike I would say, again, I'll come back to Joyce, but even Faulkner, like there's a kind of just joy of reading Kafka. Like I'm reading the the burrow a couple nights ago. I'm like, this is just amazing. Like, like I just, I, or, or I just read Josephine, the mouse, you know, this uh, mouse singer. I thought that was just, it's just amazing. Right. Like it's, and it's, and there's something about it that just, I think really, uh, 
there, there's a kind of just pleasure of reading. Thomas Mann called Kafka a theological comedian. Yeah. Which is, uh, that's one of the insightful remarks. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think he probably said that the day uh, that Einstein returned the book. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I have a couple things to say about that. You know that that um, Georg Lukacs wrote an essay called Thomas Mann or Franz Kafka, yeah, right? Like, like, right? Like his idea was you have to choose one or the other, uh, which I would reject that choice uh, absolutely. But but uh, but I also think that that's I mean like to both those things I think are so rich. So the theology of Kafka is I think incredibly important, and then the comedy. I think he's maybe the funniest modern. I mean Beckett maybe is close, but he's really one of the great funny writers and it's because isn't it because for the reasons that you've been saying like the way in which there's a torment and a, an a incredible anxiety but then there's also this pleasure and those two things come together and it's this incredible this experience unlike reading any other writer i think uh, uh, beckett had that statement he said there nothing is as funny as misery okay right. and i think beckett comes right out of kafka yeah i see yeah. that connection as uh uh, even at the level of the language that that he that he uses, but you, you know, your Joyce presents us, and I must confess, I have made it thirty pages into Finnegan's Wake a, 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 after about seven tries. Yeah, and I haven't gonna, gone that far. So. I'm never going to get there. I'm seventy eight years old. I'm 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 eight days older than Joe Biden, uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm not going to get there. But there's Joyce presenting this infinite complexity on the surface. So you've got to uh, go through all these things with, and probably never uh, uh, get beyond the surface. But there's always the promise that there's that this has all been totally organized and that it all works out, you know. That, and, uh, it, 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 and I love Ulysses, uh, but I feel that when you get to Finnegan's Wake, it becomes some kind of uh, aestheticizing of pain mm -hmm. uh, that 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 uh, that you can turn it all into some hermetic game for uh, you know as Joyce said if people sp spend half their life interpreting Finnegan's Wake I spent half my life writing it as if right. that's, uh, and and once we finish that we can deal with the economic problems of the world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Whereas, whereas Kafka presents the possibility of an immediate intelligibility. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to do a little chiasmus that, that Joyce, we have the complexity on the surface and then there's a kind of deeper simplicity and then Kafka, there's the surface simplicity and then the deeper complexity. Well, I, 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 I personally do think there's a deeper simplicity to Joyce, but I say that as a, fellow ex-Catholic <laughs> who feels that uh, that I've spent a good part of my life rewriting poetry of the artist as a young man trying to correct his mistake. He would not deal with the family, the guilt, his own psyche, his own, what he did is he aestheticized all that. Mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than, and he aestheticized it magnificently. Uh, but there's a way in which the act of writing for him was a successful play and defense that served as an answer to these things. I think Kafka could never accept an aesthetic answer. Well, I don't think he can accept any answer at all, right? Like, isn't Kafka the great writer of the question, right? Like you, yeah. you know, I think you come to the end and you're just like, we talked about the end of the bureau, the burrow, but but it's you could say the end of anything, like the end of metamorphosis. Like, what's the answer there? It's not clear. The she's, end of the end of Josephine. Like, what's the answer, right? And I just don't. I think I think that's a great point. Yeah. Like, you just don't. You never see any point in which the aesthetic delivers you from the psychic. Instead, it delivers you to the psychic. And I think that, to me, would be the difference between Kafka, who I adore and Joyce who I in many ways abhor. So I think that that's, to me, that's the, that's the, really the difference. And I, I just, I mean, I just think Kafka understands that, that he, it's through the simplicity that you get to the, 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 the real, you know, psychic difficulty. Let me try to throw one at you in terms okay. of 
because we mentioned in metamorphoses, and I'm always struck by the very end. I, I don't have the exact line. I can find it here. She stretched her young body, yeah. her sister, and I always experienced that as both she's sexual. Mm -hmm. She's being free, but it's also the body has become something grotesque. And the their bodies, body, yeah. Body and, yeah. And yeah. so I find that terrible, uh, uh, it's almost like the erotic has opened itself to the grotesque mm -hmm. and it shut down any other way of, uh, it's like the beginning of her sexuality means she's going to become Gregor. Right. Right. And then, and even the father, like, isn't the only way that he comes alive in that story is through his, when he pelts Gregor yeah. with the apples, right? Like that's the only, and that revivifies him. Yeah. And so I think you're right. Like this, 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 this horror that Gregor turns into ends up, it, it actually sprouts life in the family, it, even yeah. though it's a horrific they become life. become a family. Right, right, a right. Family. I, that's true. And he achieves, in one sense, his dream yeah. that, he's, that he's going to make them a family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, there is a theater production of that story. I do. I know that. Yeah. And apparently it is so taxing that only a gymnast or you know an actor of incredible uh grotowski like training can play the part of gregor barishnikov played the part once wow. yeah if you can imagine my son wanted to do a production of it and try to play the part and he found that once he started trying to get into those things that he just couldn't could not wow physically take uh the demands of it well i wonder what do you make of the, you know, for Deleuze and Guattari, this is the first time we're going to mention and maybe the last time we'll mention their names. Um, good guys. Yeah, they're fine. But, but, uh, well, very good Marxists. <laughs> but they're, you know, for them, the, the animals are such, play such a crucial role in Kafka. Yeah. I wonder what you, because we've talked about Burrow and we've talked about Metamorphosis. I wonder for you, and I mentioned Josephine in passing, what, oh. what, for you, does the animal, does that matter at all? Like we, when you, you talked about Burrow and you didn't mention that it's an ant, basically an animal, right? As far as I think it's clear, but I wonder, does that matter to you? It does in one sense, as you know, I sent you a painting I made of Gregor. Right. Right. I think, I think it's like, as in parable, it enables you to have a kind of an alienation effect that enables you to see things more clearly that you don't get, uh, 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 you don't, you don't immediately go into a realistic framework. You don't go into some kind of psychological probability and human behavior and all you kind of clear that away and you're able to get to some kind of, uh, plane of simplicity. Uh, I, I must say, I, I, uh, 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 his view of animals and mine are very different. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think that's a great point. I never thought of it. I, I really like that as a way, like this alienation from our normal way of looking at things right when we approach the story. Like if you're, I'm thinking of like investigations of a dog or report to an academy, both times you, like the, the, the narrator is an animal. So that forces you into this other way of thinking. But I wonder, I guess for me, it's always been a struggle because I, it seems like it's a, uh, uh, an escape from the problem of subjectivity, or at least I think that's what I identify with the animality. I mean, I don't think that's what's happening in Kafka because those animals have all the problems of, of subjectivity, yeah. just like you talked about with the burrow. But, but it makes me wonder about that choice of the animal. I mean, it's a clear choice because it happens in oh, almost so, yeah. like half the stories probably. I, I don't know. Uh, my own, uh, I would, I would, I would never write those kind of stories myself. Mm -hmm. uh, for exactly the reason you mentioned, I feel that that one of the uh, great possibilities of writing narrative fiction is that you can get inside the workings of human consciousness and show the those develop those processes, I'll use a word that you don't love, in a phenomenological existential way, that you have you have the space to- I like the second word. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> and you could say they're redundant, but <laughs> uh, that to me has always been the inherent power of that mm -hmm. medium that I can really dramatize inwardness in its processes. And I, I, I'm so fascinated by that that I never want to move away from it. But I still, uh, I still think it allows him to do certain things mm -hmm. that are. I, I, I mean, you could see the burrow as a representation of the mind's relationship to itself in terms of the obsessional search for some attempt to stop thinking. Right. I think that's one of the roles that silence has that he loves so much when he gets to it. And then, of course, the greater discovery is that you can never stop thinking, right. that, that that's inherently impossible. Yeah, and also the way in which the the noise in that story, he can't get that no, he can't find a place in the borough where he's he's safe from that noise. And having lived next to loud neighbors for most, <laughs> of, my, for most of my life from twenty to thirty, I really sympathize with that. I, I you know, I, I I think that that's, I mean, that's part of the obsessionals yeah. thing that you're constantly feeling bombarded. I, I speak as as one, like you're constantly feeling bombarded from the outside. And I think by noise, especially. And so I think you're right. Like silence is really, I think that's really crucial. And I wonder, I mean, so I think animals, I, I wonder if this is part of it, that animals are inherently more vulnerable to this, to what's coming from the outside. Whereas the site, the human psyche kind of puts up all these barriers. And so he's, he's going back to the animal actually to have this more, yeah. this, more vulnerability to the external world. That's, I think that's a wonderful point. Uh, I walk every day in a cemetery here where I uh, encounter deer and you can go up to a point, but mm. they are always, always utterly aware that they're in danger yeah. from the outside. Now, I think you and I are examples of people who are aware we're always in danger from the inside, but most, <laughs> people, but most people are not. Yeah, uh, most people have found uh, ways to defend against their own mind. Well, I think I would put it this way. I, I think most people create a sense of danger externally in order to avoid an internal danger. Can we talk about the women for a minute? Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's end with the women, because I, I think, yeah, I, I was going to bring this up. Are we nearing an end? Are we nearing an end? Well, we don't have to. Be oh, OK. An end, but but we, I, I, it, we, get, we can talk about the real Burrow, Joe Burrow. Yeah, no, that's that. <laughs> that's too sad for me to talk about. Uh, your 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 guy uh, Andy Dalton didn't redeem himself yesterday. No, i thank God we don't have him anymore. Yeah, but, you don't uh, have to deal with that. Yeah. The Bears will probably pick him up for next year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I mean, I, yeah, I have I, I have a million more questions, but let's talk about women. So I wonder, let's talk about Castle and women because I think that's maybe one of the more interesting. You kick it off. Okay, so so what I find striking about that about that novel is the way in which the women that k is drawn to women and he thinks and this is true about joseph k in the trial as well that he thinks women have some kind of secret knowledge and that he thinks to access it is to understand the key to how power works and i think that's a fascinating link between women like why would you think women understand how power works and i but i think that is really central to what kafka how he thinks about sexual difference i think that's fantastic uh, and, and i want to i want to reinforce it by something that i've been reading shakespeare's comedies lately mm -hmm. which is not easy for me that they they don't do for me what you know and it, this is my favorite writer in all the comedies the women are the ones who possess superior knowledge Right. And they're trying to educate the men so that the men are, are be able to move beyond their own power structures that they want to impose on the relationships. So I, what I'm trying to say in Shakespeare, the women do have. Right. Uh, 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 such a thing. Uh, but the women in Kafka, if they have it, aren't give, the, the women in Shakespeare have it and are trying to give it to the men. Yeah. 
they're all, I mean, Rosalind is the greatest example. I was going to say, yeah. as you like it is the best yeah. example of that. Yeah, right. they're all trying to give it to the men because they know if they don't, the guys are going to, the, the guy's stupid power stuff is going to come down on them. Right, right. Uh, I just read Love Labor's Lost the other day, which is an underestimated work in that sense because the women are so much cleverer than the men. Right. Uh, right. In Kafka, the women refuse to give any answers. Right. Good, they, because I don't think they have any to give. Well, that would be. The, the, yeah. That's a, a, a. Who was the cynical guy who said that's the mystery of women that there is no mystery? <laughs> I know that's pretty good. Whoever said that, they have good. a secret, but they, they have, the secret is they got no secret. Right. Right. Uh, right. That's. Uh, I don't. I don't like biography that much, but it seems to me that Kafka's relationships to women were so uh, ruled by by. A fear of intimacy. Yeah. Uh, that What's the longest relationship? Maybe like a year and a half. He constantly was. And they're going all, and they're all st- built up on distance. Right. I know. Yeah. The two guys who just, you know, I love you as long as you're not in the room. I know. I know. I know. Uh, yeah, I think. But I think. And now I got. I'm going to get. I think Kafka was a solitary. That was his great strength. That was that was where he was happy. Uh, well, he was a solitary who could never be alone, which is why he's tormented, I think. Right. Could he never be alone? Well, I think he, he had his parents with he lived with his parents most of his life or he was in a sanitarium like he I think he never really got, you know, you know, just like he needed to Virginia Wolf. He needed just a room of his own, I think. Yeah. I mean, I don't want I don't I'm not prescribing him anything because I, I wouldn't want him to be any different at all. But I, I do think, you know, that that that's the tension within him, that, that like he's drawn to women. And yet he he I think you're re- exactly right. Like he's a solitary. He he understands that he can only be satisfied alone, but he's constantly drawn to women, pulling him out of his yeah. aloneness. And yeah. so he's it's in this he's in this impossible you know, I position. got a note for you on that one. One day in Vienna, I was walking down the street and I ran into this place that had a plaque on it. It said, "This is the hotel where Franz Kafka used to stay whenever he'd be in Vienna." It was a very fancy ass hotel. <laughs> well, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't not wealthy. Yeah, like he had. Yeah, some, he know. had money, right? I mean, his father was 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 rich, so you know, he wasn't. He, are, you, uh, are you reading him now? Are you reading all these things in the German? Uh, not for the class, but I've read, I read the trial in German and I've read a lot of the stories in German. And I, I think your point about the German is exactly right. So I read Der Salberberg, the, the magic mountain I've by Thomas that. Mann, impossible in German. Just, yeah. in, I mean, it's hard to read it in English and in German it is, <laughs> it is impossible. So I, I, you know, in the end I had to, I read it, I read it first in German. So I read it in German, then I had to read it in English right afterward to try to get a sense of it. So, but Kafka, exactly the opposite, yeah. utterly approachable. And I think this is why Deleuze and Guattari call him. I mean, they think they make something of the fact that he's writing in German, even though he's Czech. Although the notion that that, that he's a minor, it's not like he's writing in another tongue because he spoke German from the time he was a, sure. a baby. Right. So it's not like it. So I mean, their idea is that he writes in German like a non, like someone who wasn't totally German. But I'm not sure I get that because I just think he writes in such an utterly clear way. And I almost think the translations don't do it justice because I think it's it's so hard to like, here's what I think it's hard to do. German is an incredibly complex structural language. And to make it simple, English is so structurally easy that you can't make it any simpler. But I think you would have to somehow perform That's that true. operation yeah. on the form of Kafka's stories in order to correctly interpret, uh, cor- correctly translate them. That's very interesting because I'm thinking back to the kinds of books they use early on in teaching German, and you know, you get to, and Kafka's perfect for that. Right. I, here's what I would I would give German one. I would give Heidegger and Kafka. That Heidegger is uh, you can read Being in Time if you had first grade German. Oh. 
And it's perfect because it's always showing you how the language is relating to itself at all. Right, right. Yeah. He makes up all the yeah, words by just putting things down and you got the damn language. That's right. That's right. Eric Santner, who I, a friend of mine, Eric Santner once said to me, the problem with being in time is a lot of people read it and think they know how to, they know German after reading it, but they don't. <laughs> and I think that's really true. I read, I remember reading it. I'm like, okay, I got it. I know German now. And I, then I read Hegel and I realized I don't know German yet. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, yeah. Or, yeah. or Thomas Mann. Uh, yeah. Or Mann. Right. 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 I wonder. I wonder. So let's talk about Kafka and psychoanalysis. Then. I, I, because I, I, I really, I feel like he's maybe the great psychoanalytic novelist, and he had knowledge of Freud. So there, yeah. there's certainly yeah. some, some. I think conscious intent on his part. And I think, you know, we've talked about superego, which is, to my mind, maybe the one of the great key psychoanalytic concepts, if not okay. the key. You know, I, you, I, I probably think that's the concept I've worked on harder than any other one. Right. Right. And, and so Kafka is clearly exploring that. I, and, and I wonder to what extent do you think he, that is true of him, that he's the great explorer of the psychoanalytic problems and, 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 and really at work on those. And I wonder you know, to maybe some instances of that, because I think to me that's true. And I like we were talking about the sexualization of authority in the castle. Like for me, that's a great instance of the way Kafka's thinking. Like for, that's clearly some idea he's picked up from Freud. I think if I were and and if I were going to teach a course on Kafka, and I love the syllabus of yours, though I don't see how you ever got anyone to do all that work. Well, it's, I, 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 bet, I don't know if anyone did it all. Terrified. I know, I know, it's a lot. I, but I, you know, you have to say that I did. I left off one thing. I left off the. I left off America, the the you disappeared to, man, right? You have to read that. Yeah, that's that's. If you're going to exclude one, that was a good choice. Yeah. Uh, I think I would start with the the dream work in Freud's interpretation mm -hmm. of dreams and get people say once you get enough of this dream logic ready that you can also start to experience your own dreams in a rich way, then you're ready to read Kafka. Yeah. Because he will then take you to places in dream that you haven't gone to yet. I mean, that's the beauty of dream is that so many of the dreams we remember are short circuitings of the dreams we didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's so great. It's such a great point. I, I, I you know, it's interesting because I, I, when I come across writers or filmmakers that intentionally try to reproduce dream logic, I'm very disappointed. And and yet with Kafka, I'm not disappointed. And I wonder what I think it's because he understands that the dream feels real. And I think I and, I, and if you think of like Buñuel, no one watches a Shan Andalou and thinks, oh, that seems, it feels real. It doesn't feel real at all. I mean, I, I have a certain appreciation for that, but, but I, I, I think it's just so limited because it tries to take the dream logic and, and it thinks, oh, anything goes, but that's not the point of a dream. The, oh. the dream convinces you that it's real. And if, and if, you know, I, I, my girlfriend in high school was a, she was a conscious dreamer. So she always, exactly. in her dreams, if anything happened that she didn't like, she'd say, this is my dream. I'm not letting that happen. And I said, I should have broken up with her right then. But she said, you don't understand what you're not letting happen is you. I, I, well, that's a great point. I just said like, look, you're missing out on all the best things. <laughs> the best, like, no, the best no. thing, like, like the best <laughs> dream I ever had was me encountering the thing that was absolutely most traumatic for me. Yeah. And the point was I encountered it and then I met someone that also felt like it was the most traumatic thing. And then I, I felt this incredible bond. And then I met Hillary like a few weeks later. So it was a nice little, <laughs> like I, it was like what Keith says about Adam, Adam awoke and found his dream to be true. Um, but I think like if you if you take away the trauma, then you take away, and you, this is what you said about reading Kafka, right? And to take it one step further, there's a concept that uh, the analyst Bion has that's very powerful, though he doesn't develop it well. He says there's a dream that puts an end to dreaming, and that's the one that we are most resisting when we dream, that we want to somehow continue 
dreaming, that the dream can be terrible, but it continues in some way. And there's a dream that puts the uh, uh, an end to dreaming. And I think those are always the dreams in which you are at the end of the road in some way, that, 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 mm-hmm. there, that there has been uh, a cardiac arrest of the psyche or something like that, that the death has in fact occurred. Emily Dickinson tries very hard to have that dream. Well, uh, Kafka doesn't. I yeah, think Kafka that, does that, not, right? He wants to like, keep dreaming. He wants to keep dreaming, right? And I think, like, to me, the end of, you've you've seen that, the the Michael Haneke movie of Castle. I think that the ending is one of my favorite parts of that film because it just, it captures this total interruption. Like, the end is just an interruption of a thing that's going on and on and on. And I think Kafka's really good about that. And I mean, for me, Castle is the great one about this. We got this thing that could just play out infinitely right like there's no he never has that fi- that dream that ends all dreams yeah uh it's possible that i i gave i gave that dream to a character but then i've invented it for that character and it might be a completely uh uh and it, it's the thing that that amazed me about my own thought about it is how bare and empty of drama that dream put an end to dreaming was you know it didn't have it wasn't apocalyptic it wasn't a pirate that would all came before it was more uh, a cold empty uh, 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 atmosphere where nothing was happening mm-hmm. where I, it, but it's just you know it's just a guess uh, well it's like but, i mean it's you're just describing the heat death of the universe right? <laughs> the heat death of the universe also you're describing uh, uh, pure Thanatos, right? In your right. within your own psyche, uh, uh, if it if it uh, uh, if the the finality of death, while you're still alive, uh, has to finally be, it seems to me, something. Emily Dickinson's got one poem where she's looking at a dead body and she's trying to, she's watching it die and then she's watching it and she says, and she says, it stiffened, that was all. Mm. Absence of, of any meaning. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, I mean, it's interesting how Kafka doesn't have those moments. Yeah, like he just doesn't have them. Like I think there's, and I think it's torment. tied. To, what he prefers torment. Yeah, yeah, I, that's right, that's right. Uh, what's the la- the final it's line from like Psycho Nietzsche's? The the will is saved, the dream is saved. I w- I was thinking of the last line from Wild Palms, like between. Oh, which yeah, yeah, nothing. Yeah. I'll take uh, chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let people look that up. I want to, I, I, like, <laughs> I, I think, um, this idea like that Kafka doesn't really integrate death into his, I, I wonder if that's why nothing ends. Like, I think there is a profound resistance to ending in Kafka, right? Like the, I mean, the America or the the disappeared man, no ending trial. There's a kind of ending forced on it by Max Brode. We could talk about him in, in a second, but and also Castle, no ending. So I wonder, and a lot of the stories, no ending, right? So I, I think that that's that is something to him. I, I, I have only one thing to say about Max Brode. He did the world many services, but saying things in interpretation of Kafka were not one of them. That is true. Whenever he tries to, he's so far, he's so wrong. Do you? What's your view of this whole that whole little thing? Do you think Kafka knew that Brode would not burn the stories? Who knows? He did it all know. It, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, Virgil wanted the Aeneid burned. Uh, Emily Dickinson left orders to somebody she trusted that all of her poems were to be burned. Uh, the person started reading them before she burned them, and she said, "Oh God, these are good." <laughs> <laughs> I think all of them. The minute that that per- the person you pick for that is a strange choice. To that me. is a, it's a psychically, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? But like it, you're, but it's, but it's always it's it's always it's always such that to me is a sad notion that a guy would go so far and so deep and make such an enormous contribution 
to our disorder and then would want it to, to would want to, in effect, destroy his own life. Because I think, I think the only thing that could compel him to do that is that he thought he had contributed nothing. Yeah. Like he thought he just had such a lack of a sense of what he was doing. He takes us back to the superego. Yeah. Yeah. Which you that, it, that even the invention you, it cannot deliver you from that. I hope you yeah. face that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a really, I think that's exactly right. Like he, he, I mean, that has to be what's driving that feeling because think about how many people have scribbled on their deathbed things that they want to be yeah. preserved, right? Like that, that, that they, you know, uh, although I, 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 when I think of the deathbed, I think of, I think of Marx who said last words are for imbeciles who haven't said everything they needed to say. <laughs> right <now." laughs> or Hegel, it's my favorite. Hegel said, only one man understood me, and even he didn't understand yeah, me. But, you know, Goethe apparently said two different things. They claim he said more light, and he also said, bring me the piss pot. I know, I know. <laughs> I always use that as this example of you you, you practice a last line for so long, and then this, uh, this, this continues. And the other line, line. yeah, because you got that one line, is that, that's going to be a real good line. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite academic experiences was one a quarter out in Santa Barbara. Stephen Lacey and I, it turned out, were both teaching the intro to Shakespeare at the same time. So we decided we would bring our classes together and team teach. And what we've been doing this time brings that back to me. That Because uh, you and I, he and I did the same thing that you and I are doing. It was a back and forth and and each one uh, uh, both contributing to and questioning the other person's uh, uh, ideas. And uh, and it's 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 one of uh, uh, it's it's one of life's real joys. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree. I agree. Thanks so much for doing this. This and is so, I've... so few people have it yeah i you know uh, the, the 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 uh john dewey wrote a very bad book called the quest for sure i'm john dewey of vermont fame that's right say. of vermont uh, fame the great john dewey but he wrote a book called the quest for certainty which which is a very bad book because it it puts that above all other needs yeah to me i think what we're doing right now like the engagement is just it, it's so beyond certainty, right? Yeah. Like it's the, it's defined. I think what it, what's interesting is to find the, the point of, of a, the fundamental question that's driving, for instance, Kafka or you or me yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's always seemed to me that if you can find the person's question or problem, you found something much more valuable because that's, that's the real repeatable possibility. Right. In there. Right. That you can, uh, and you find your own. I always told students, the only thing I can do is help you find your question if you yeah. want to find it. Well, I think it's so true because, you know, like that, that's why you're doing what you're doing is you're working out that question or problem that is your whole existence. Right. And I think Kafka is such an exemplary character of that uh, exemplary subject who does that. Like he, he, he can see he's really working out the same problem in all these different ways. That's a really neat idea too. Cause that means that, that, that he was was really authentic. Yeah. That, that he preserved the problem and his relationship to the problem, rather than to try. It's always easy to get a false solution. Right. What if we? What if I said to you, you get one Kafka story to take? So you already said the trial would be the novel you take with you. What? 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 What one Kafka story would you salvage if they're all sinking the bottom of the ocean? It's, I wouldn't do it for aesthetic reasons, but I think it would be the judgment. Interesting. I thought you were going to say hunger artist, which we haven't talked about at all. We haven't talked about it, and and, and we both are examples of it. Yeah. Uh, now that I weigh less than you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's. I'm going to have to do something about that. <laughs> you just more muscle weight. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure. <laughs> uh, but... The hunger artist. Uh, that that now that you've mentioned it, uh, that's a hard choice, and we haven't talked about that. But I, I, you know, it's another one of throwing the thing. The last, the ending of it is so perfect. I, I just never found any food I liked. I know, I know, you love that, but, but that's not the very end. 
the very is, end is the panther, right? They're watching the oh, panther, right. and they're totally satisfied. I think did you know Rilke you were talking that story. What's that? Did Rilke know that story? Ah, uh, it's a great question. I know. After <laughs> poem, is I know, I know, I know. It's yeah. yeah. He okay. had to have known it. He had to have known it. I mean, uh. But I wonder if I mean, because, you know, even in, in uh, the 10th Duino elegy, there's some there. The panther appears there as well. Right. And it's this. And in that sense, it's exactly the same logic as in as in the uh, hunger artist, because the panther the whole point is that the panther replaces the hunger artist and people find. And I think this is kind of what we we're talking about, about people, you know, not being able to be satisfied with their dissatisfaction that they that. They, they 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 can't stand the hunger artist and they and they prefer this this lithe beauty of the panther right this kind of non it's completely sustained in itself even though it's in captivity but that's yeah it's it's behind bars yeah 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 so it's a, it's a great i mean it I, that's why i think it's this great abandonment of freedom in that in that story you know that that at the end by the audience really I have to think about that. That's really interesting. I guess I wanted to hang on. I did, I'd forgotten that. that yeah, the, yeah. It's always great these things of what you remember and forget. It, it's especially so with movies how I misremember them. I, I, I know. changed the goddamn movie. I know, I, but sometimes you can make a better movie in your yeah, mind. It's like a dream. What you're doing is you're you're changing the the trajectories of the desire. Hey, thanks for it. This was so phenomenal, Mac. Thanks I, for I, talking. I loved it. I've been up since three thirty this morning. We love the